Okay. We'll do a quick review for chapter 17, and this is what we talked about last time. So it's a little, again, it's kind of abstract, and I uh, spent some time in our previous class and devoted to connecting these uh, abstract concepts to more familiar concepts from physics one, like gravitational potential energy. And then tonight we're going to talk about capacitance and storing electrical energy too. So essentially the idea that we come with is that when we talk about potential electrostatic potential energy, it means that we have stored energy, stored electrical energy. And just like if you lift up a rock, then you do work in lifting the rock, you do work against gravity. And that gives it potential energy. And then if you let gravity take over, gravity will take that potential energy and do work and give it kinetic energy. Now with charges though, it's a little bit different because the charges are really only discrete when we're talking about very small quantities. But usually if we're talking about charge flow, you know, in a wire or something like that, it actually behaves more like a fluid. So that's why we define uh, electric potential. So electric potential is really just uh, the energy per charge. And when we introduced volts last week, uh, when we did our lab, that, that was the idea. It's the energy carried by a charge carrier. We also talked about how the electric field is sort of the slope of, um, of a potential map. So in this case, with two parallel conductors, uh, geographically, this would sort of act like a, a ridge of mountains and then a canyon uh, with a nice level surface stretching out between the two. And so the canyon would be below sea level perhaps, and then the ridge would be higher. And then in that case, if everything is nice and straight, then the electric field lines or gravity, if you will, would run in parallel lines and the equipotential surfaces are everywhere perpendicular to those. So the electric field is uniform and that means that when we plot these equipotentials, our capacitors charge up to 20 volts right now and the equipotentials of 15, 10 and five are equally spaced amongst them, except for a little bit of curling at the edges and that's called the fringe effect. Right. So here's what two point charges look like. And in our discussions on Tuesday, we talked about how the positive charge is sort of like a mountaintop. And the negative charge is like a hole in the ground. And the red lines, the electric field lines, show you the path that water would flow if it was trying to run between the two. And then the green lines are equal potential lines or like a contour map. So it's important to understand the difference between two charge distributions like this. Parallel plates create a uniform electric field between the two, but isolated charges do not make a uniform field. And the potential goes as KQ over R, where the electric field is the negative slope of, of this plot. And, you know, just for, uh, like a calculus connection. So since the electric field is uh, like the rate of change of voltage with respect to distance, and we take the derivative of one over R, that's where the R squared comes from. If you're a calculus fan. All right, well, <clears throat> uh, capacitance is something that we're gonna talk about tonight. And I'm gonna hold off on this part because this is the new thing, and there are only a couple more slides for us to talk about. What I want to do is I want to go and take a look at energy storage with you for a little bit. And here's what that looks like. So I'm going to open up our agenda and then take a look at a couple of, uh, of examples. So starting off, when, when we pay for electricity, we've already made the point that um, that a joule is a very small unit of energy. And you personally use a lot of electrical energy during the course of a day, because you really don't have to 
you know, keep an eye on it too much. We live in times where electrical energy is ridiculously inexpensive. And that's actually one of the obstacles of uh, renewables is because renewables have quite a bit of uh, capital outlay in order to get them to, to start um, harvesting electrical energy. So let's take a look at a typical battery right here. And so this is called a sun extender. Uh, this is a battery that's designed for charging and uncharging. A typical car battery is not gonna do very well uh, being charged by solar panels because um, what your car batteries are used to doing is they're used to providing a tremendous amount of electric current to turn the starter of your car, but then they, uh, they don't use very often. And so they never really get depleted all the way. They never get lose their charge all the way. Because uh, if that does happen, then we have a problem. So typically you could uh, discharge a car battery all the way down to zero and then charge it back up. And then maybe you get one more full discharge out of that. And then after that, the battery's all done. So that's just the nature of its design. But batteries that are designed for uh, solar power are used to being discharged and then charges, charged back up again. A place where uh, you typically see batteries like this would be in RVs or boats. Um, so they're called marine batteries and they're, they're designed to be discharged and charged back up again, hundreds and hundreds of times. And so that's really convenient for solar power. Now, this particular uh, battery says it's rated at 42 amp hours for $161, and it weighs 30 pounds. So let's see, uh, how much is the energy that's stored in here worth? I'm going to go to the whiteboard and, uh, and take a look at that. So I'm going to stop sharing and change my camera. Well, look at who's here. Hi, everybody. Okay, good. So here's our little battery. <clears throat> Got two terminals. And most batteries are based on lead acid. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a classic oxidation reduction reaction that's happening inside the battery. And that involves two metals that are involved in some kind of exchange. So <clears throat> the lead acid uh, batteries, they have a potential of about two volts per cell. But then you're like, wait a minute, how do you get 12 volts then? So we put a voltmeter on here and connect it up and that says 12 volts. So that means we already saw this when we did our, our lab last week that when you put batteries in a line, then the voltage increases. So the 12 volt battery actually has six cells in it. <clears throat> so this is uh, what we get for lead acid. Uh, for a carbon zinc battery, yeah, that's the standard. Battery that we use. Then we get about 1.5 volts per cell. And a lithium ion battery. So if you take your phone apart, most people don't, don't get excited to do that. Yeah, it was sort of like this thin package. And that would be a lithium ion battery. Yeah, the lithium, um, you know, it's a very, it's a highly reactive metal. It's um, one of those ones that is very poisonous and kind of dangerous to work with. But it does give us about 3.7 volts 
per cell, which is pretty high. And so I think that's right. So uh, that's why you can just have a single cell power your, your uh, phone. Now, the sun extender is rated for, uh, we said 42 amp hours. So let's unpack that. What does that mean? When you look at battery storage, like let's suppose you're in the market for a new laptop or a new phone, something like that, and you want to get some information about the battery storage because, uh, you know, that will determine how long it, the charge is going to last. So as you're shopping around, you want to pay attention to something that's called amp hours. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and work with this. What, what is an amp hour all about and how does it relate to kilowatt hours? So <clears throat> this, if we break this out, this is amps and this is hours. So this is actually, in terms of variables, uh, this is equal to current and this is equal to time. Is that big enough for you to see? Okay, good. So amperes is the unit for current, hours is obviously the unit for time. And then of course we have V up here. So we know the power, do I wanna do red? No, I'll shift, I'll go to black. Okay, we know that power equals voltage times current. But what we really wanna know is not how necessarily how powerful the battery is, we do want to know how powerful chargers are because that will determine how much time it takes for them to charge. But if um, what we're really are interested in is energy and energy equals power times time. But if we substitute for voltage and current, then that means energy is equal to voltage times current times time. Now, if we assume that all 12 volt batteries are going to be 12 volts, then we don't really need to have that on the package. So instead, what we can do is report out just these two. This is amp hours. On uh, your cell phone, it might say milliamp hours, or on a laptop, it might say milliamp hours. But that's what those two units sugar off to. So if we multiply these two, if we multiply 12 volts times 42 amp hours, let's see what we get. So the energy for this 12 volt battery is gonna be equal to 12 volts times 42 amp hours. And so we'll multiply that out and see what we get and see how we can handle those units. Okay, so that gives me 504. And again, the units. So we're gonna have 504 volt amp hours. Now a volt times an amp is a watt. So this is 504 watt hours. But if we want kilowatts, then that's equal to 0 0.504 kilowatt hours. So how much is that worth? <clears throat> well, we know that there's about uh, one kilowatt hour cost about uh, 12 and a half cents in the Green Mountain State. Not too bad, but for some of the Midwestern states, they pay a little bit less because they're using those coal and gas fired plants that are really cheap and super dirty. By the way, I was uh, wondering, um, you know, I did a pH test in our garden. We do that every year and just trying to, you know, make sure that the soil is healthy and, um, and as I started doing it, I'm like, well, this is, it's kind of 
alkaline, you know? Like in some spots, I was getting a pH of five. <clears throat> and, whoops, sorry, that's how it was very acidic. So a pH of almost 5.5, something like that. And I'm like, that's pretty weird. So I went to my chemist friend and, you know, we talked about ways to neutralize that. And, uh, but I said, why is it every year? I, you know, I'm working on this thing and every year it seems like the soil gets back to being acidic. And he just said, it's just acid rain. That's where we are. Thank you, Midwest. All right, well, let's finally finish this off. So zero point, and this is in dollars. I think my decimal is a little bit bigger. Dollar sign, 0 0.125. Okay, so this battery sells for about $160. Yeah, interesting. So when I multiply this out, I multiply these two numbers together, then I get uh, 0 0.06, whoops, there's no zero there. Oh no, 0 0.63 dollars. Right, so I mentioned the price tag on this was $160. But the exercise we just did is we took the information about the rating on the battery and we priced out how much that stored energy, the energy that's stored in that battery when it's brand new, we priced out to see what it's worth and it's worth about 6.3 cents. That doesn't seem right, does it? So why is it so expensive? And How's my audio? My headset just said I was disconnected. Does it sound far away? It's okay. Thank you. So we priced out this $160 battery, but it only contains six cents worth of, of energy. So what you're really paying for is the ability to tote it around or to be portable and to use it when you need it. But you can see that in a car battery, that makes sense because it's really hard to turn over the starter on your car. And so it's convenient to carry around a battery that'll be able to do that for you. But if you're gonna actually think about this, if you were living off grid and you had solar panels and you're trying to charge batteries, then this battery only stores about half a kilowatt hour and your daily use might be something around four kilowatt hours. So you're gonna have to have a lot of batteries and they're not cheap. So about $160. So, Next week, I'm going to have a little exercise for you where you can try and conceive of an off-grid application of solar panels and then just see how the, how the logistics work. Right. Okay, so that's just a quick thing about how to pay for electrical energy. Let's take a look at some examples. So I'm going to go back to my screen view. Let's go back to I'm going to stop sharing my screen or start sharing my screen again. Okay, and share this. So as I mentioned before, um, Green Mountain Power would really like you to get one of these. It's a big battery. 
that's wall mounted. And uh, so they have a special package now. You can get two Powerwall batteries for uh, the small price of $5,500. And it's just a battery that sits on your wall. <laughs> What's that all about? Uh, the general idea is that if you do have solar panels on your roof, that you could charge the panels during the day and charge up this battery. But if you enter into this relationship with Green Mountain Power, uh, they're going to pull energy from your power wall at night. And so that's one of the ways that we can sort of smooth out, use a production that doesn't necessarily match demand. So anyway, there's interesting things. Yeah, look at that. So if in case you do have power out, then you've got backup for your house and it can run your house for a couple of days because uh, it's got a lot of storage. Right, okay. So uh, this can store, I believe, uh, something on the order of 10 kilowatt hours, something like that. So if you're a modest user and power goes out, then you probably would have uh, lights for a couple of days. Okay, so let's take a look at this chart then. So if you've downloaded the PDF, that's great. Uh, if you, um, if you're just sort of playing along at home, I, I want to show you how this math works. Right. So, um, so let's take something. I put in a few things here. So the, the idea is, how much does it cost in order to do these? And I can do a total down here as well. So a cell phone charger, about five watts is going to probably take about a little over two hours in order to charge your phone. Okay, so let's do this then. Uh, power, in this, sorry, this should say just kilowatts. So in kilowatts, five watts is going to be 0 0.005. And then you're using it for about a little over two hours per day. Uh, in order to get to the monthly use, then we're gonna multiply that by an average of 30 days in a month. So 2.3 times 30. So about 69 hours per month. Okay, so kilowatt hours per month. Well, we're gonna multiply kilowatt hours times the number of hours of monthly use. And that's how we get kilowatt hours. And that's um, 0.345. So I'm, I'm showing this for a couple of reasons. One is just you know for your uh, general literacy as far as energy goes. And then the other is that uh, this project that I'm talking about for next week involves coming up with a plan for using solar panels for some off-grid application. And then you're gonna need to walk through a similar process for this. So now I can take this and I'm gonna multiply by 12 and a half cents to see how much this costs. And our monthly cost is about uh, 0.043 dollars. So about four cents to charge your cell phone a month. And then there is, um, there's sort of like an urban myth about what happens to your charger. And I'd like you to just kind of uh, unmute for this, because I'm, I'm curious to see if you've heard this before. But if you leave your charger plugged into the wall and it start charging your phone, that is still using electrical energy. Has anybody heard of that before? Yes, I have. I feel yeah. like it's bad for the phone battery for some reason too. Can you say that again for the? That like it's supposed to be bad for the phone for some reason, but I, I don't understand like how that. <laughs> when they're not touching 
Is it some kind of like telepathic bullying going on? No, like if you leave the phone plugged in, but it's fully charged. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so it depends on the, the charger and the phone itself too. So when the phone is, um, is really low, then it's going to ask for a lot of current and to charge quickly. But then once it gets up to like 90% of its full charge, then it's just a trickle. So, uh, so no, it's not really bad to just leave it plugged in. And, uh, and the so-called ghost current with your charger plugged into the wall and, uh, and you know, it, does it still use energy? <laughs> That's a six pound miniature poodle. Um, anyway, it's a myth. So I actually, I, I took a charger apart and I said, I need to get to the bottom of this. And I, uh, so I did some measurements on the charger and I, I did the math and all together, I think it's something like the total cost to your electricity bill over the course of one year would be about half a cent. So the same thing is true with power strips that are left on that little LED if nothing's plugged into it, but you leave the power strip plugged in, they don't really use any current to speak of. Uh, so that's not, we're not gonna save the world by, by uh, worrying about whether your cell phone charger is plugged in or not. All right, so yes, your cell phone, essentially it's free. How about a laptop? Let's take a look at that. So uh, 130 watts. Uh, this is just based on the laptop I'm using. And I looked up its specs. And so that's 0.13 kilowatts. And it takes about 1.2 hours to charge. And so if I multiply these two, then, uh, ooh. Uh, all right. So I, I just thought of something uh, different, um, <clears throat> but that's okay. So a uh, monthly use for a laptop, well, I, I'll multiply that by 30. So 1.2 times 30 and I get 36. And so what, kilowatt hours per month? So I multiply that by the number of kilowatts and I get 4.68. and then multiply that by 12 and a half cents. And I get still a decimal. So about 59 cents a month. I don't know, are you surprised by that? I'm only surprised by that. So using a laptop is really a great way to go. Um, if you wind up using a monitor, so in case, occasionally I set up a dual monitor and I've got, a, you know, it's a TV, um, then that's going to use uh, more electricity. But just for your laptop, really, it's pretty much free. But now let's take a look at these two. So here's our refrigerator. And let's just do this really quick. So the refrigerator is coming in at about 0.3 kilowatts. And then the microwave is coming in at 1.5. Okay, so I'll let you think about this, right? Average daily use. I doubt that your microwave is used for an hour a day. So let's see if you, you can come up with a decimal for this. And then go ahead and extend it out. And the reason why the refrigerator is only on for eight hours a day is because it's not on continuously. Most of this has to do with the compressor, you know, when we look, looked at uh, heat engines. And so the compressor cycles on and off and so typically the compressor is on for about a third of the day. Depends on how many times you open the refrigerator door, right? So if you don't open it very much, it's going to be a much smaller uh, number. But if you have a roommate who seems to need a snack every 15 minutes, it could be much higher. Okay, let's see if you can uh, fill out the rest of these numbers.
All right, so now when we pull back and just think about what are the big contributors to your overall monthly electricity bill? Um, yeah, the top three are definitely not it. And in general, it's anything that's involved in heating and cooling are gonna be very expensive. So this refrigerator that I used, I used uh, uh, details from a fairly new and energy efficient refrigerator. And so adds about $9 to, to your bill. So typically anything that's involved in heating and, and uh, cooling is gonna be very expensive. So an air conditioner, very expensive. A clothes dryer, very expensive. And also, because they're big users, then these are not things that you would typically want to run with solar panels. So microwave, laptop, cell phone, LED lights, all could totally run on solar power. But the refrigerator, not so much. That's going to be a battery killer right there. And then the same thing is true for like an electric range or oven. You can't really drive those. And so actually it makes sense from a more energy point of view is to run those with natural gas or uh, some kind of fossil fuel that has a pretty big kick to it. And you can even run a refrigerator on fossil fuels. I think I mentioned before that um, many months ago I had a kerosene refrigerator. All right, well, that's uh, what I wanted to share with you as far as paying for electricity. And we'll talk more about that when we, uh, I introduced this project on Tuesday. All right, so now I'd like to go and uh, take a look at our notes again and take a look at this idea about what a capacitor is. So we've seen this capacitor thing show up a couple of times. It has the property that the electric field inside is uniform and you can store charges. So if you pile up positives on one side and negatives on the other, they attract each other. So it has a tendency to kind of hold on. So even though we know capacitors are two parallel plates in a circuit, we can see them read like this. So this is a little bit different than the way uh, a source voltage is drawn. And when we started drawing circuits, I did sort of a top-down method and we're going to continue to do that for a while, but then when we get into uh, in about two weeks, then we'll start doing it uh, differently. So capacitance tells us about the ability for one of these devices to store charge. And it's a pretty straightforward relationship. Capacitance refers to how much charge can be stored at a given voltage. And why you know, why would that be a fixed number? The reason for that is because I'm just gonna pull out a simulation now. And um, here's a basic idea of a capacitor. So I'm gonna grab uh, a voltmeter. That looks good a voltmeter down here. And I think that, um, let's look at the plate charges and the capacitance and the stored energy. Give it to us all. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and put one probe on one of the plates and the other probe on the other. Okay, so this is a 1.5 volt battery, so I'm gonna turn it all the way up. Whoop. Now, when we've uh, turned the battery on, you can see we got positive charges here and negative charges here, and they attract each other. Uh, so that's why capacitors are good at storing charge. But this is a long way away, and so the force of attraction is not gonna be as strong as if they were closer. So I can take this and I can Squeeze it down. Okay, it looks like that's as close as I can get. I'll reattach the voltmeter lead and it should say 1.5. Now, when I brought these together, you saw the capacitance go way up. But there's another way you can change the capacitance as well. And that is 
by increasing the space for the charges. Because right now, they're all crowded together. And why does our voltage sort of, why does our charge kind of peak? And the reason is because there is only so much space to fill here. So even though these positive charges are attracted to the negative ones across the gap, they're repelled by their peers. Lots of jokes there, but they're repelled by their peers when you try and pile more charge on, it may or may not want to go there because there already is lots of positive charge. So if you make more space, then that also increases the capacitance. All right. Now let's take a look at a dielectric. And so we'll do the same thing. We'll have our voltmeter out. And we'll do stored energy and plate charge and capacitance. Now, I don't want to make these smaller. What I want to do is look at the difference between having this out and having it in. So dielectric can be a number of different things. Let's just try Teflon and see what that looks like. So a dielectric material is something that can be polarized. And if it can be polarized and then you put it between the plates of a capacitor, that's going to enhance the capacity because it's a way of providing additional ways, like sort of like heat capacity, additional degrees of freedom to store the energy in. Does the 2.1 have um, any significance next to Teflon? Yeah, it does. That's the dielectric constant, and we'll see how you use that in just a second. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and charge this up. And then let's go ahead and flip this in. So you can see that with this uh, thin layer of Teflon, that it can be polarized. So these molecules in the Teflon got rotated, twisted, and that took energy. So that, that's a way of storing more energy. So let's just take a look. The stored energy here is 2.09. I take it out and it drops to one. So dielectric can help store energy. You even see charge flow. Okay, great. Now, what if you have multiple capacitors? Okay, let's see two in series. And we'll charge it. And this is sort of like having extra distance between the plates because now I've got a distance here and a distance here. Another trick is that you can see that if this plate is positive, this plate is positive because this plate's negative. And so the charge on this plate came from the other side. But the voltages need to add up to whatever <clears throat> the battery voltage is. And then we can find out the amount of charge on each plate because that depends on the capacitance. If I increase the capacitance, we see that charge is gonna flow. All right. And now let's try two capacitors in parallel and see what that looks like. Now they're side by side and it essentially provides more area. So this uh, capacitance, these two in parallel, they have an equivalent capacitance is actually more. And we can find that by simply adding them. So let's go take a look at a couple of practice problems. Just three of them. So I'm going to stop sharing and hit the whiteboard again.
Okay, so we have a 9200 uh, picofarad capacitor, and it's got a charge of, excuse me, 16.5 uh, times 10 to the minus 8. And we want to know what the voltage is. So should that be 9,500? Or we're is doing 30. Yeah. Yeah, it is fine. Thank you. All right. So um, this formula is pretty easy to remember because the formula tells me how much charge is on the capacitor. So the Q always comes first, and then it's P times V. So if we're solving for V, V is going to be equal to Q over C. Okay, and the charge is 16.5 times 10 to the minus 8. We'll leave out the units for right now. And then picofarads is 10 to the minus 12. So this is 9,500 times 10 to the minus 12. Let's try and take a guess about what we're supposed to get for an answer. Uh, this is around 10, and so the numerator is 10 to the negative 7. And then this, well, this is almost 10 to the 4, so that's 10 to the minus 8. So we have 10 to the minus 7 divided by 10 to the minus 8. So it's going to be like 10 something. So that's always useful just to kind of rationalize uh, what the math is going to look like, and that'll help you recognize if you wind up making a mistake. Okay, about 17.4 volts. Sounds about right. Easy, right? Okay, good. Let's keep going. Why don't you just take a shot of that if you want. Give you about another 20 seconds or so before we go into the next one. Sorry, can you explain where you got the 10 to the negative 12? I mean, yeah, it's this guy. It's the next step after nano. Millimeter, micrometer, nanometer, picometer. Okay, good. So let's take a look at the next one. And this involves a battery charging up a capacitor. Let me take a wire and run it down here. Take a wire and run it down here. And then we turn it on, so plus, minus, or also known as ground. And we'll see these charges are gonna flow this way and pile up charges on one side of the capacitor. And charges are gonna flow this way. And then if you disconnect the battery, then those charges are actually going to stay there. And they can stay there for a very long time. It's not really practical for storing large amounts of energy because the bigger the capacitor, much gets much more expensive. And they're not really um, set up to hold large amounts of charge. But what they are really good at is sort of being a backup, like a filler. Like, for instance, one. Uh, example of a capacitor's use is in uh, stereos where really big speakers and the speakers will 
draw a lot of current intermittently, and then a capacitor can be available to help provide extra charge. That's one example. But another example too is that based on how well these charges are held together, you can use it for timing. So it takes a characteristic amount of time to charge up and a characteristic amount of time to discharge too. And we have a little mini lab uh, for that coming up. So anyway, the question was, we have a 12 volt battery and the capacitance is 77 microfarads. So C equals seven microfarads and V equals 12 volts. So we're just solving for Q. And Q equals CV. So if I keep this in microfarads, then my answer is going to be in microcoulombs. So seven microfarads times 12 volts. And so that's 84 microcoulombs. Yeah, not bad. Not too bad. So I'll give you like another 20 seconds or so just to just to be thorough. And then one more. And what we've got is a capacitor with opposite charges of 5.2 microcoulombs on the plates. And this time we're given some information about the electric field. It's uh, two kilovolts per millimeter. Uh, they want to know what the distance is. So we've only talked about this in sort of a hand waving sense. That having a smaller distance is going to increase the capacity to hold charge because the force will be stronger. But there's one slide that we should probably take a look at. Just go a little bit further. So here's our, our formula for how you can calculate capacitance based on its geometry. So A, cross-sectional area. Make more space, you get more charge. D, if you make the distance further, then the charges can't attract each other as well. So, so we can't, um, can't pile on as much charge either. And then we have this, this epsilon naught. I just want to make sure we're at the end. Right, so epsilon naught. Well, let's do a little, a little investigation. We'll go out to the internet and then we'll <clears throat> type in permittivity of free space. There we go. Whoa. Okay, so that's what epsilon naught is. And 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. But those are some crazy units, isn't that? Uh, 
Yeah, I just went to the whiteboard really quick. But those units are nuts, aren't they? That's amperes squared seconds to the fourth power divided by a kilogram meter cubed. That's nuts. Okay, let's go back and we'll take a look at that problem again. So should you need to <clears throat> calculate the capacitance based on geometry, it's gonna be equal to epsilon naught times A over D. But is that really necessary here? I mean, we're asked to find out what D is, which is a separation between the plates. And I've got D here, but I don't know anything about the area and I don't know what the capacitance is either. But for this one, we can kind of think about what the electric field means. And so we already know that electric field equals, whoops, batty, minus delta V over delta D. So it's the negative gradient. But of course, um, let's drop the deltas here for a second. And we can even drop the minus sign too, if you want. So this is gonna be a V over D in an absolute value sense. And then we know that um, V as we took a look before is gonna be Q over C. Um, let's see, I really need to, yeah, that'll be fine. All right, so our electric field is V over D, and then I do this substitution. So this is gonna be, uh, did you feel like we're missing something now? Mm -hmm. Your screen's a little fuzzy. I don't know if it's just me. Do the focus. Oh, wow, that's a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay, what are we supposed to find here? Um, oh, we're actually supposed to find the area. Okay, never mind. So, yes, we're going to use this formula, but we're supposed to find area. And we have the electric field. Okay, that sounds good. So if I rearrange this, I know about the electric field, so I want to be able to use that. I don't know what the voltage is though. So let me multiply both sides by D and then V is equal to electric field strength times the distance between the two. So I misread this. We're supposed to find area. Then I come back up here and uh, take a look at how I can utilize this. So um, we know that uh, the charge is going to be equal to uh, C times V. And we know that E, sorry, we know that the capacitance is given by this. And we know that the voltage is given by this. So if we break this out, then this is going to be equal to epsilon naught A over D. And then the voltage is the electric field strength times D. Yeah, and there's a little bit of cancellation here. So the Ds cancel out. And I know the electric field, I'm trying to solve for A. I know what this is now, and I know what Q is. So if I rearrange this, and again, this is Q here, and I'm solving for A, I'm gonna divide both sides by E and epsilon naught. So area is gonna be equal to Q
over the two E's. Right, so 5.2 microcoulombs, so 5.2 times 10 to the minus 6. So it's kind of small, and I'm probably at the very bottom of my screen. And then the electric field strength, this is kilovolts per millimeter, but that's not acceptable. So we have to change that. So 2 kVs per millimeter, and we'll do a little dimensional analysis to straighten that out. And so one kilovolt is equal to 1,000 volts. And then one millimeter is equal to 10 to the minus three. Whoops, sorry, 10 to the third millimeters. Whoop, whoop, sorry. Ah. One millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters. Sorry about that. Okay, well, one over 10 to the minus three is the same as 10 to the third. And so if we're gonna do this in volts per meter, then we're going to be multiplying by a million. So this is actually 2 times 10 to the 6 volt per meter. Just want to pause on that and make sure that we did everything OK. All right, so if there's any, um, if we don't have any questions about that, then we'll roll with that. And so this is going to be 2 e times 8.85 e minus 12. All right, big numbers, little, very small numbers. Let's see what you got. So if you wouldn't mind, why don't you uh, once you get a number, why don't you pop it in the chat? And it um, really helps my self-esteem. Yeah, I'm just taking a look at the chat right now. Mary, and I'm sorry, I, I missed it, your question. It must have been from a while ago. It's okay, I, I figured it out, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, so if you get a number, why don't you throw in the chat? Yeah, I think I think the correct rounding would be, um, you know, usually I think two to three significant figures is good. So, 0.29 or 0.294 would be good answers. So, wow! Well, so that math wasn't too hard. It's going to be a breeze to do the questions. All right. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen again. I'll change the camera to all right. And <clears throat> look, I'm going to go back to taking a look at the agenda. And I'm going to ask you to do something on a browser. Good. 
So we breezed right through those practice problems and we took a look at how to do that. But now I want to talk about um, this drawing circuits. So I'd like you to start practicing the skill of being able to draw circuits and doing them in the top down format that you know, we started off with last week. Now to help you out with that, there's a link here called Schemit. And it's pretty easy. <clears throat> uh, and I'll, I'll follow the link right now and then you can see what they what to type into your browser. Okay, so this is it up here. And I'd like you to try that now. So DigiKey is an electronic wholesaler. But they have this app that's uh, free to use. So it's digikey.com slash schemet slash project slash. You don't have to register. You don't have to log in. You can actually just go to try it now. And we're going to use this platform to do some simple circuits. It's up to you whether you like the grid or not. I'm going to turn mine off because I'm going to ask you to copy and paste the circuits that you build into a Google Doc. And now I'm going to go grab some schematic symbols. And there are all sorts of fun things. Uh, but I'm going to grab a voltage source. And you have several different ones that you can use. And I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to um, actually, the way we've been drawing the circuits, the top down version, is a style that's uh, favored by electrical engineers. And I like it because, from a teaching point of view, is because it shows um, the idea about charges losing energy as they, as they go through. But I'm not seeing the, the real types that I was looking for. Anyway, let's go to um, passives. And there's a capacitor. We'll come back to that later on. And let's use a, um, let's grab a resistor to pull that out. So it's labeled R1, that's fine. You can turn on the name if you want, if, you, if I click this checkbox. And then it just says resistor, but that's probably gonna get kind of cluttered. And let's grab four of them. There are one, two, three, four. And what I would like to do is I'd like to examine the different ways that we can connect these together. I haven't given up on finding that uh, battery symbol I was looking for. Okay, so here we go. I could certainly do them all together. 
And I believe that this is snapping to a grid, so I could put them next to each other. And there should be a ground somewhere, so I'm just on the lookout for that. We did sources already, browse to that. It might be the fact that you get more options if you log in, and that might have been where I saw that before. So let's just go like this. Uh, if I connect all these together, so I'm just going to click on endpoints and draw a wire. Okay, so this would be parallel. And series is not very hard to imagine. So that's two different combinations. And then I can uh, always take this, let's see what kind of tool I've got right now. Looks like I have a select tool, so I can click and drag and highlight this. And you can copy and paste this into a Google Doc or a Word Doc, whatever you wanna use. And so this is all four in parallel. Now you could do them all in series, and that's pretty straightforward. So I'll, I'll let you figure out that one, but I wanted to show how you can make combinations. Whoops. I don't want to do that. I just want to get rid of the wires. Okay, good. Now what would a combination look like? Well, I could have two in parallel. and then the other two in series. Then I can just connect these together. There we go. So that's a combination number three. <clears throat> and so with these four resistors, how many different combinations can we come up with? Now, FYI, <laughs> just doing this, let's see, I don't know if I can move them. I think I can select them. So uh, click on this, shift click on this, control click on this. Yeah, and then I can move the two together. So I could bring them up here and I'd have to redo this wire, but I'm not going to. This, this is not a different combination. This is equivalent to the same one I just did. So the order in which they show up doesn't really matter. All right, so what would be a different combination then? Let me get rid of these wires. Well, I could do three. I could do three in parallel and then one trailing behind. And so these are the things I'd like you to explore. And like I said, you can just um, send me an email with this as an attachment. And I'd like you to find six different combinations, six unique combinations. And if you wanna do more for bonus points, then I'll give you, for every extra one, I'll give you a bonus point on, on, the, uh, on any of the quizzes. Uh, but there, if you wanna know the answer, the total is nine altogether. So six mandatory, and you can do uh, up to nine if you want. But some of them are kind of tricky. So yeah, that's what this little assignment looks like. So just um, make a Google Doc or any other kind of document, put your name on it, indicate you know something like um, Joe's circuit combinations or something like that. Then you can, uh, if it's Google Doc, you can just share it with me. Or email or whatever you want. 
All right. So any questions about this? This is sort of like an additional homework because the math is pretty light for for this uh, chapter. How are we doing? <laughs> okay, thanks, Beth. All right. Well, if you want to, if you have any other questions uh, or if you want to talk about something, you're welcome to hang out uh, afterwards. So I'm going to stay online, but that's uh, what I've got for tonight.